If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 1. We'll be finishing James chapter 1 today, and we'll be in verses 22 through 27. And the title of this sermon is Doers and Deceivers. And it's putting the Word of God into practice. You see, this is what James has been building up to. James has started in chapter 1, and he has been writing to a dispersed group, a group that has been come under persecution, a group that has uh, lost everything. It's, it's kind of the... Uh, they. These people that he is writing to are, are refugees that have left their homes. They left everything. And James is telling them and he's pointing them that as they go and as they have felt like they have, their life has been wasted away because they have lost everything according to worldly standards. James is telling them, don't waste your life. He is telling them to be doers of the word and not deceivers and hearers only. So as we come to this passage, we have seen how the word of God, how James has been building up. He, he's given them imperatives that he's, he's, he's telling them as your faith is being tested that you should count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith is going to produce something. It's going to produce steadfastness. And that as you come under temptations, that he reminds them that as you go through these tests, don't fall into temptations. But you have something to stand on in your life as you're going through this horrible time. He says it's the word of truth. He says in verse 18, In James chapter 1, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures. He's telling them, you have the word of truth. That is why you can count it all joy. Because he says in in verses 19 through 21 that, that as you know this, that you should be quick to hear the word of truth, slow to speak and slow to anger. Because you have received with meekness the implanted word. So now the word that we stand on is the implanted word that is written upon our hearts. And now he's coming to his thesis statement here in verse 22 through 27. And that this statement will be built upon the rest of the book. The rest of the book is going to be built upon this one statement. And he says this, and this is the word of God. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, Being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's pray as we continue. God, we thank you again as we come before you. God, I pray that this this message would go forth, that we would understand what it is to be a doer of the word and how we are to use the word correctly, rightly handling it. God, I pray that today that you would open hearts, open ears, that you would quiet tongues. God, as we receive your word, And as we go and do your word, Lord, I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. So the question today is, how are we to be doers of the word? How are we to use the word to become a doer of the word? And I have three points here as we jump into our scripture today that we are to use the word 
as an examination. We are to use the word as a restoration. And we are to use the word as a transformation. That is how the word of God is being used here as James is giving it to us and to those who were dispersed. So we are to use the word as an examination. Verse 22. He says this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So there's three aspects here that we are going to examine. And we see first that we are to be doers. We are to be doers. See, this verb right here, to, uh, but be, this verb be is a imperative. It is an imperative. It is a commandment that he is using. Be doers. He's saying that this word doer, he's like, you need to become through a, uh, you need to have to come into being something that created that you do, that your mind, spirit, soul, your emotions, everything about you is to be a doer of the word. And that this doer, this isn't something to be as a weakened warrior. He says, like, if you come into a conflict, you're to be a professional soldier. That's the doer you are to be. That this is something that has completely changed you. And now you are to be at warfare constantly. Be dedicated to it. This is your profession. This isn't something that you're just going to go and think, oh, I'm just going to repair something around my house. You know, and I'm going to take off my other hat here and, and put on a builder hat. No, you are a professional builder. That is your profession. You are to be a professional doer of the word. And see, if we look at what a doer is, he's really not emphasizing here what you are to do exactly. That's the rest of the book. But really, he's emphasizing what you are. That's what he's referencing here, is what you are. When you receive the word as it's implanted in you, What's it producing in you? What kind of fruit are you bearing? What soil are your feet in? See, that's what he's saying here. It's something that we are characterized as. It, it's, it's not like you are just going to go and say, oh, what's the cheapest gas? Oh, 10% ethanol, 87, boom. No, you're to be putting jet fuel into yourself. That's what you are to be. You are to be a doer of the word. That's what you are. That is what characterizes you. That's the energy that you're putting into you. If you think about it, you have received Christ into your life. And the spirit is dwelling in you. The energy you have is from God. Go and do it, and this is what really the basis of what James is talking about later on in his book is that faith is in works, right? He's saying that you are to be a doer of word and doer of the word, and your faith is to be at work because of the word that's in you. That is what he's saying here. He says, but we see the second part here in James 22, as we examine ourselves, as we are looking at these different aspects of who he is writing to, he says not to be hearers of the word. Now we understand that we are to hear the word. That's why in verse 19, uh, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger as he hears the word being preached, right? As he reads the word, we are to hear it, but we're not to be hearers only, okay? You're not to be, as we come to church and as we hear the word being preached over us, you are not to be just someone in the audience, like at a concert. Or you're not to be someone in the audience as you watch a movie. We don't need, it's not to be like an auditor, like you're just going to audit a class. Like I'm just going to come and, oh yeah, that's, that, was a, that was a good sermon. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed that, you know, and, and you just, it just kind of tickled your ears a little bit, kind of made you feel good, you know, 
but you walk out and you have absolutely no accountability over you. You heard the word, but you don't obey the word. You're, you're just to hear only. You're not doing the word. You're not living it. It's not changing your life. You know, tragically, I, as we went to conferences and you hear some of these theologies that are kind of this, I, these ideas that are kind of popping up, it, it's tragic because I think a lot of people are just auditors today that attend church. They're just auditing churches. Well, I didn't like what he said there, so I'm just going to tear it out of the book. We don't need that. Yeah, well, well, I liked what he said over here, all the things about love. Oh, yeah, man, check that box off. You're auditing. Are you just someone in the audience? Are you an auditor? Or is the word of God changing your life? Are you a doer of the word? Are you just being a pretender? That's, see, that's what he's saying. You're just merely a, a hearer of the word. You see, the problem is, is that the line in the sand is drawn between sinner and saint. It's drawn. Which side are you on? You see, it's, it's clear. 1 John 3.10 says this, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. You're one or the other. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. The work of God is not in you, is what he's saying. You're not in the faith. Even Peter, this is the same thing that 2 Peter 1.10 says. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. If you have been called by God, if you've been elected by God, then you need to be confirming that. How? For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. You're putting your faith to work as you confirm your calling and election, as God has called you by his word, faith comes by hearing, by hearing the word of God, as he has called you through uh, his word and elected you, you are to now go and practice these qualities that he has now installed in you through the implanted word. You see how this keeps going around and around. Tragically, we see so many people waiting to confirm this. And I, what are you waiting on? You see, it's not a, this, this practice of the faith is not just some experience. And wh what I mean by that is people who are just auditors and pretenders, they're waiting on that special experience that they can claim. That they hold on to. They held on to this experience. Oh, I got moved or I got this. It's not a feeling, it's faith. And what he's saying, what I'm trying to say here is that you have something more stable and secure to hold on to. And it's called the word of God. That's working in you. You see, he's, he's making the point here also that it's not enough just to hear the word. We must do it. And he's stating here that it's the hearing, it's not just the hearing, but it's the doing that brings blessings in your life. Verse 25 says, and I'll read it here, uh, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. It's the doing. Now you can just imagine that these are the people, the refugees, who have lost everything. You think something needs to be done to them. But James is telling them, you need to go do, and it's the blessings as you go and do. You see, if you think you're spiritual just because you come and you hear the word, but you don't go and do and it doesn't change your life, 
Listen to me. You're just kidding yourself. You're just playing church. The word of God, if it's not changing you, it's not in you. See, and that's what James is saying. You're just deceiving yourself. That's the third person that we see here. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourself. You see, this word here is it, it, uh, parallel gizomai. It means to delude. It means that you're coming, literally coming up alongside the person. Okay? So like, here's the faith and here you are and you're coming up alongside of it and, and you're just uh, trying to reason. But it's often the idea of that you're, you have false reasoning for the purpose of deceiving. It's like you're coming up to it, but you're not in it. And so you're just kind of deceiving yourself because you're not in it. Does that make sense? And, and so you, in mathematics, we have this that is called a miscalculation. See, you're just miscalculating. You think because you, you are close enough to it that you're in it. But that's, a, that's the deception. That's the deluding. That's the miscalculation. You miss the mark is another way we say it. Because any response to the word of God other than faithful obedience is self-deception. I'm going to say that again. Any response to the gospel that does not include obedience is self-deception. You see, a, a profession of faith in Christ, MacArthur says, that does not result in a changed life that hungers and thirsts for the God's word and desire to obey that word, the profession is only that, a mere profession. You see, we live in an area that you got to come up and make this profession before everybody. You walk up there, man, you're... I'm here. I make the profession. And then you walk and sit back down. You walk out the door. Your life's not changed. And you think you did something good. So you check it off the box. I'm good. You're not changed. See, that's what Satan wants. He wants you to think you've done something good. You checked off the box. You made the profession. But you're not living the life. Satan loves such professions. Because they're damning. If they don't change your life and make you walk in obedience. You see, I have a, a set of scriptures here. They're kind of long, but it's so good. Because we see that a seed that is implanted in you, it gives and it grows and it bears fruit. So when you look at what James is saying, are you a doer, a hearer only, or are you just walking in deception? Which one are you? You see, at the end of the Sermon of the Mount, we have these kind of three paragraphs that Jesus gives in Matthew 7, 15 through 27. He says this, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their what? Fruits. You will recognize them by their fruits. These are false prophets that you're going to recognize by the fruits. And he gives the illustration, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No, they're not. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits." So Jesus is talking about the false prophets and how you're going to recognize someone who is a true saint of God by their fruits. Now, see, I used to have a, 
when we bought our new place here in town, we had a pear tree that, man, it's awesome. It produces awesome pears. And then we had this plum tree. Man, it looked beautiful. I mean, it was just this beautiful plum tree. It very old, you know, had flowers on it. And then those flowers turn into plums, juicy red plums. And so I went out there, I picked one off, dust off. I'm like, yes. I took it by. It was horrible. <laughs> I mean, it a sand, I don't know, a sand plum. And, and so it just was not sweet. It was bitter. You know, it was in season. And it was just, it was nasty. It bared bad fruit. And I instantly wanted to cut it down. <laughs> later, a few years later, let me explain that tree now. It started dying. You see, if we are constantly producing bad fruit, eventually it gives way to death. And that's what Jesus says here in verse 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, there's your profession. There's your profession. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father. Do you see that? The one who does the will of the Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy your name and cast out demons in your name and do many my works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine. See, here's the hear. Here's the hearing. And does them. There's the catch. There's the bait and hook. Will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the rain fell, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had, not found, it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them or does not do them right so here's the hearer that does not do will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it so how can we know how to examine ourselves right this as we look, we get to see what type we are, but then how do we go farther? How do we look at and see how to examine ourselves? In verse 23, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forget what he was like. So he's like a guy who looks intently. This word, look intently, is uh, it kind of carries the idea. He just kind of glazes over, right? He's kind of, oh, yeah, 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 okay. And so it's like, and then he gives the illustration. So it's like a person who looks in the mirror. And back then, what they would do is they would get a piece of metal and shine it up real good, and then they'd have to kind of work that mirror to see which way and kind of examine themselves and so you can just be, imagine, you're looking in a mirror. Has anyone ever thought you had something in your teeth, right? And so you're like, man, you're, you're like looking at it, you know, you're getting way back there. You're checking them all out, right? And then you find it. And you go, oh, yeah, there it is. And then you just walk away. And you got something still in your teeth. That would be terrible, right? So that's kind of, it's like you're just kind of glaze over without a care and you kind of just walk away and you just forgot oh yeah it's there but uh, I'll forget about it you see he gives this idea and he gives us three things here as we examine these people that look at the word of God they merely glance at it themselves you see, they read without retaining. It's like they just kind of go through it like a story in a chapter, you know? It's like they're just reading it, and it doesn't change them. Imagine also like you're going to a doctor, and you, you've fallen, and you, you think you broke your arm. So you go to the doctor, 
And the doctor's like, oh, hold on, let me take a Polaroid. Shh. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's a good, good picture. And you go, shouldn't, shouldn't you take an x-ray? That's, that's the person who just kind of glances at this. You read the word, but you're just kind of looking at it, and it's not penetrating into you. You just glance over it. And I think the second mistake James is pointing out here, they, for, they, 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 they kind of glance at it, and then they forget what they see. You see, when we look at the scriptures, at people who have come into contact with a holy God, and they have felt the weight of their sin, what was their response? Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6 says, Woe is me, woe is me, I am undone. He's saying, I am a sinner, and I'm in the presence of a holy God. See, when you come into contact with the holy God, you're going to cry out, woe is me, because you feel the weight and burden and conviction of your sin. Peter, when he was fishing, he was called as a disciple, and he realized that Jesus had called him, and he basically had been fishing all night, all night. And then Jesus comes to the shore and says, go out a little bit further and throw your nets off. And he's like, I've been fishing these waters all night. So he, he does it, reels in a ton of fish, and he realizes right then, he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I am sinful. See, when we come into contact with the holy God, and we feel the weight and conviction and the guilt of our sin, this is our response. Are you feeling that weight and conviction of sin right now? Don't just glance at it. Don't just see it. And don't just walk away from it. That's what the mistake number three is. See, if you fail these three, you're just walking away. You'll never obey and why would someone just turn away and not obey God's word? And I got three points under this. One, they think hearing is the same as doing. You see, you think if you talk the talk, then you must be walking the walk. But Paul says, For it's not just the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And the reason why he says that in verse 15 goes on, because the law is written on their heart. Is the law written on your heart? The second thing is they just simply do not know the word. And they're just waiting for something to happen to them, some spiritual awakening or experience. Don't wait on it. Let the word weigh on you, convict you of your sin, because the same word that does that also reveals Christ to you. And the third reason is they just don't like it. They just don't like it. You see, there was a missionary uh, in one of the commentaries I read. I don't know which one. I don't have it here. But he basically gave the story that a missionary went to some remote place and they came across a witch doctor. And the, witch, and the missionary showed them a mirror and for the first time they saw their face. And so the witch doctor, she, she wanted to purchase that mirror from that missionary. And when the missionary realized that she wasn't going to take no for an answer, she bargained with her and sold her the mirror. And as soon as she purchased the mirror threw it down and smashed it. And the missionary's like, why did you do that? And the witch doctor says, I didn't like the ugliness that it showed. You see, the word of God is going to show you some ugly things in your life. Some detestable things that only you and God know. It's going to reveal the things in your mind, your heart, and it's going to convict you. But the good news is the same word that examines our hearts 
reveals our sin also restores us to a Savior. You see, and that's the second point here, that there's restoration in God's Word. Verse 25, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, how do we know restoration has happened? The first thing we see here is that there is a different word for the person who now looks into the law and the word of God. Okay? There's a different word. Paracupto is a different word. He looks intently now. He looks, and this word is used by Luke to describe Peter as he is coming in the tomb. He is like, as the Jesus has been resurrected from the dead on the third day, as he said, and his garments are folded up nicely there. Peter walks in, you know, after John had beat him in a race. And, um, and John uses the same word. They come in, they examine it. They're, they're looking to see the evidence in the tomb. This is the person who lo- looks at the perfect law. You see, the law was given, and the point that James is giving here is that a faithful hearer and doer of the word does not just study the mirror itself, but rather what the mirror reveals. That's what he's saying here. It's the perfect law. It's perfect because it was God-given. It's given because it reveals the sin of us. But then look what he also describes it as, as liberty. And it's liberating because the same one that reveals the sin in Romans chapter 7, if you want to read that, liberates us. And it now begins in verse 8, chapter, or chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, it's liberty because it was revealed by the law that you were a sinner. And now you see that Christ died for sinners and he's now a savior And you believe in him. And the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. For sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who now what? Walk according to the... Not, the, according, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, in our society, Satan works very hard to portray sin as the greatest freedom. That's what he did at the beginning. He lied to Adam and Eve and says, you can be like God. You can know like God knows. And it's going to be free. You see, but that freeing moment of your sin is is what is convicting you before God. And it's bondage. That's what it is. But the liberating part of Christ, Thomas Manton says, that duty is the greatest liberty And sin is the greatest bondage. You've been liberated. It's not that you're just saved from God's wrath, but you're saved to something. You're saved to walk in His ways. It's liberating. Don't you want to be liberated from the bondage of sin? See, that's what the Psalmist 119, that's what we've been going through in church, our call to worship. The NASB says this, And I will walk at liberty. Why? For I seek your precepts. I seek your precepts. You see, the word of God has a mere ministry. It's what cleanses us. It's what shows us our sin, but then cleanses us. It cleanses the church in Ephesians 4. Or 5, sorry. It washes us clean. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It has a mere ministry. Because it restores us. You see, as we, as we have been cleansed by Christ, we still walk in a world that tries to throw up soil on us and dirty us, doesn't it? 
but we have a, 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 the word of God restores us as we come and as it reveals sin and we confess our sin. But it also transforms us. You see, James 1, 26 through 27 says that if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. You see, the religion that he's talking to is the external, the religious, the rituals, the the routines, the ceremonies. You know, a lot of people believe that they are religious because it's everything that they've done. But what does he say right here as we apply God's word to us? He said, if he does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. It's amazing that James uses a 1,500-pound horse here as an illustration for the tongue, right? I mean, has anyone ever been on a horse? You know, I remember one time, Crystal, uh, when Jax was little, he... uh, Went with old Papa Jack to ride a horse one time, and he was young, and man, he was excited. I don't know if you know Jax. He gets excited sometimes. And um, man, he was excited to get on that horse, and I said, no way, Jose. And uh, so my wife stepped up, and she got on the horse with him. Well, Jax back then, man, he, he, wanted to, he wanted to be a cowboy, and so he had boots on. And it wasn't until that horse started, like, running uncontrollably out of fence, um, <laughs> Jack, you remember that, right? That Jack's actually had spurs on. And so as he was um, like holding on for dear life, he's also spurring the horse. (laughs) And so Crystal, um, being the awesome mother that she is, grabbed him and like belled over, you know, and jumped off the horse. And all of a sudden the horse was fine and they were not. But isn't that sometimes how our tongue gets away from us? That we think we're walking, but then as we look to the Word of God and as we realize that the first thing that James is saying, because he says it twice, be slow to speak in verse 19. Now he says, bridle your tongue. Maybe there's an issue there. As we look to gossip, as we look to kind of be out of control sometimes, what's the first thing that happens? We start to speak. James says, bridle your tongue. Why? Because out of the tongue, the heart speaks. I mean, out of the heart, the tongue speaks. Matthew 12, 33 through 34. But he also tells us, as we look to apply it, that as we should bridle our tongues be slow to speak and quick to listen, that we need to care for the needy. He says here that religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, that as you are being dispersed, that you should be doers of the word, that you should be bridling your tongue, but also that you should be caring for the weakest in the society. Be doers of the word. Care for those in need. You see, one of the saddest dimensions of our day is that so many Christians are so just concerned with their, with their seminars and their charts and their books and their studies and their discipling techniques that they don't take the time to think about others. Sending food to someone in need. Sending a card. Going, helping the needy, the elderly, the lonely. You see, Roger Ellsworth says that it's, it's easy to be a very good Pharisee while the world cries for a good Samaritan. I think he hits the nail on the head there. And James, as we go through the book, he is going to build. It's not just the orphans and the widows, it's those, the, the, the poorest in society. See, back then, those are people who could not provide for themselves. 
according to society standards. They really couldn't get a job. They couldn't take the inheritance. Uh, they were very needy. And James is telling those in the dispersed to care for those in need. But he also is telling them to avoid worldliness. Avoid worldliness. Don't let the world set the standards for you. As we look and as it is easy to get on Facebook, as it is easy to get upset with politics, the world does not set the standards for the Christian life. Only the Word of God sets the standards for the Christian life. Amen? And in closing, I end with this. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. As we look to see that as the Word of God transforms us, that we have to understand that we don't get, we're not going to go through these things perfectly. It's because the Word of God reveals that they are imperfect. And 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But as we are looking to be transformed, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18 tells us how that works. Now, the, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. He begins and ends that section with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord. And what he means is this, that we are being transformed. We are, this word is metamorphosis. It's kind of where we get the idea as we look to this as a, as a um, caterpillar, an ugly, those little ugly hairy things, as they are um, change from a caterpillar to a butterfly, they, they metamorphose. They go through a stage of metamorphosis. Gosh, that was terrible. Uh, <laughs> but what it is, is they're being transformed. And as we look to the Word of God, it is renewing our mind. It's transforming our mind. Romans 12, 2. And that we are going from one degree of glory from this flesh that will die to one day we will be with the Lord because of the spirit that dwells with us will now take us to heaven and we will one day be with the Lord forever. We will be transformed from one degree of glory to another. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for today. God, as we look to your word, God, as we get to examine it closely, God, may it do a work in us. May it transform those who, God, they, they've come alongside, but they haven't bought in. God, may you, through the will of Christ, purchase them tonight. God, would it change their life, that they would not just be hearers of the word, they may not, not may not just be deceivers of the word or deceiving themselves, but God, that they would be doers of the word because of your transforming will for them. God, I pray for those who are in Christ, that God, that they would continue to grow from one degree of glory to another as we look to Christ. God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.